And this uh, brings us to our next session. We're going to talk about drones. Um, and our next speaker is Arnard Kirslin. He is the head of uh, R&D at DJI. Like, how many people have heard about DJI? How many of you own the drones from DJI? So they've, they've really, like, you know, the whole consumer drones or in general how people look at drones have completely changed by DJI. Uh, and now they're getting even more powerful with, with a lot of, like, you know, the uh, computer vision, image recognition capabilities directly on the drone. So with that, I welcome our next speaker to talk more about it. Hi, everyone. Um, so today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about how um, we see the place of AI in the drone applications and, of course, in the sky. So like I was so nicely introduced, my name is Arnold Chirselin. I'm the head of R&D for DJI in the US. And my department is working on several initiatives for the company. We're a very large company. Um, <clears throat> But basically, the, the, the biggest part is everything that is related to developer technologies. And this is very relevant because, as you're going to see throughout what I'm going to present to you, the name of the game today is to get these drones in as many hands of creative people who can put them into work in a wide um, diversity of applications. And the other part that I drive is a lot about enterprise and special projects. So you, most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the work we do on the consumer field. Um, and this is an important aspect because there's a lot of applications for AI on our drones directly on the consumer field, but it's very much nothing compared to what can be done in a commercial scenario. So of course, DJI, uh, I was going to ask how many, but I already have the sense of how many of you know about us. Um, but this is very much like a very quick uh, snapshot of the products that we do. We're very, very famous for the drones, but if you look into the broad spectrum of everything that we do, we are, we're a complete robotics company. And we started with flight controllers, which was you know, these little computers that is just flying the, the aircraft for you, uh, very much making the difference between a remote control aircraft and a drone. Um, but we also gain a lot of expertise and, and uh, domain knowledge in image stabilization, image processing, and everything that is relevant to get a drone up in the air in a uh, productive manner. Now, of course, we have all of our de developer technologies. And uh, like I said, we have like a wide variety of tech in here, going from uh, enabling people to create applications on mobile, iOS, or Android. We have also SDKs that allow people to develop applications directly on an onboard computer that you add to the aircraft. Uh, if you want to have more complex robotics behavior, we also open up the hardware stack for people to create their own payload, which ends up being a lot of sensor, which opens the world into all sorts of different kind of data that you'll be collecting. And the last one was opening up the Windows SDK as we are working with Microsoft to try to bridge our two ecosystems to enable everyone to build the, you know, the most advanced uh, technology that we can imagine. And of course, I mentioned about DJI Enterprise. And, and it's a very, very big initiative that we have at this point. <clears throat> and it's everything that we do is global. Right? It's worldwide, but every country has different approach to it. Uh, and so this is a very specific department in DJI that is focusing on, on closing and understanding what that solution is supposed to be. And believe it or not, but the majority of, of the ecosystem doesn't still really understand what an enterprise solution looks like with drones. So before I dive into this, I want to like give you like a bit of a snapshot to get everybody on the same level as to um, what are, where is the drone industry in 2018. Now, of course, we have the consumer market that you know of, and this is people taking their drones, you know, to fly because as soon as you're up in the sky, you're going to love that perspective. You know, you have these crazy good pictures. You can use it for sports. You can use it for selfies. You can use it for a lot of different things. And, and it's been you know, extremely fun for a lot of people. And we dominate that market uh, because we produce extremely high quality products at a very affordable cost. And the high quality is important because it's about bringing what people want. And what they want is that really, really good 
image that it can capture. So if it is about tracking you as you're biking around, we'll bring what we call Active Track, which is an AI implementation that allows you and follow you. But it's not a silver bullet AI. It's a mix of a lot of complex robotics algorithms and, and behaviors that are coupled with AI to have a very deep understanding of the surrounding. But it's also, as you can see on our Mavic 2 here on the picture, it's collision avoidance. Because what people want is not to fly the drone, in the essence. They want to be in a certain amount of control, but they don't want to have to be like the pilot that is flying it and tweaking it. And so these sensors in the front are analyzing what's around it. We have them also on the top and on the side. We are 360 at this point. Um, and they control the aircraft and prevent to go anywhere else. You know, once again, this is what consumers are looking for. And there's tons of application, small, affordable. It's great. But then there's the enterprise market. And there's just no shortage of applications. So I've pointed out a few here, verticals. And I want to be like pointing out a couple of, of scenarios that are going on. Agriculture is a big one. I'm sure most of you have heard already, something called precision agriculture. And this is where we're trying to collect better amount of data to understand what's going to be the yield. You know, like when you um, water a field, you're not going to have an actual uniform watering of that field. So you're not going to have uniform growth. When you spray a pesticide, it's going to be the same thing. A lot of the strategy in agriculture in the world for pesticides, for instance, is very similar to carpet bombing. You don't really know, so you spray it all. And you spray, and you spray, and you spray, and you spray. But understanding exactly where you need the spray makes a difference in the quality of the product, in the amount of pesticide that you use, and all of the uh, side effects that will come from it. But there's a lot of other scenarios. In public safety, it's absolutely incredible the work that we see and that we're promoting. And we're in a situation that I'm sure all of you know we have another fire, multi -fi multiple fires in California. And our drones are being put in the air every single time there's a major incident in the world. Because they give perspective, they give information, they give a lot of insight onto where to plan and how to plan the next move. In the world of construction, it's dramatically helping in gaining a dramatic amount of productivity. I'm talking months shrunk into hours. In the world of infrastructure, there is a lot that is being put in place today to prevent catastrophic failure of infrastructure. I'm talking about bridges who are not being maintained enough and are collapsing. I'm talking about wind turbines who have their blades who are broken in two, throwing them up in the air. All these scenarios are being actively tackled by getting insight and perspective on the situation. Now, being in the air gives you that physical perspective, but understanding what you're looking at is actually the most important. But when you're trying to go into an enterprise solution and getting these drones to fly, you'll see that there's a couple of challenges. And the first one that I really want to point out and as a very big item is integrating the drones in society. Now, there is a lot of logistical problems in having drones flying around you and, and in the airspace. Now, drones have a huge advantage compared to traditional robotics. They do not evolve in the main human world, which means they don't need to navigate around you. They don't need to navigate around your streets. They don't need to navigate around your house. They navigate in the air, which gives them the flexibility of going quickly in a lot of places with a lot of flexibility. But still, we need to coordinate and we need to continue working on bringing uh, this integration. Now, focusing on the technological side here, this is a lot about empowering these drones to be smarter and more cognizant of the world that they're evolving in. That is, like I mentioned, obstacle avoidance, uh, to try to see exactly if there's an obstacle right there. But this is also understanding that there's an airplane that is coming in, that you're ready to position through ADSB, and calculating a course to remove yourself from a, a dangerous area. And of course, there's a lot of things that are not necessarily AI-driven, but are absolutely essential, like the work we've done with fly safe and no-fly zone systems. And then the second problem that we see is whenever you want to start deploying a drone program, how do you manage five or 10,000 drones, all right, with five or 10,000 pilots? Because it's actually a big issue 
that is very similar to something you're probably familiar with, like mobile device management. But the interesting things about drones is as we present them to customers, they suddenly have unrealistic expectations. You know, they take a process that was like six, seven, eight months long before, and we tell them, hey, we can do it in a week. And they say, how about doing it in two hours? And how about doing it like, you know, with 5,000 people right there? And this is fine. We're all about the challenges. But this is something that it needs to be solved in order to get these drones in as many areas as possible. Now, I really want to be focusing once we uh, uh, understand clearly what an enterprise solution looks like, where are the opportunities? So the first thing that I want to talk about is this three-step. This right there is the recipe of a um, solution of deploying drones in most enterprises in the world. You capture that data, you process that data, and then you act on that data. Now, now that you understand this, we can start walking and, and, and hashing each of these pieces one by one to see exactly where everything is. But first, let me just walk you through a little bit more about that full pipeline. Capturing the data could be taking a picture. It could be flying a LiDAR unit. It could be having an infrared sensor, multispectral cameras. It could be a radiation detector. It could be absolutely anything. Flying just gives you that perspective, gives you that proximity, gives you that access to the danger, gives you all these different things. And this is the part that is actually important. But to capture, you need to get where the data is. So there's a strong navigation component, there's a strong control component, and there's also a strong limiting the amount of data you're going to collect. And after that, you have that data. Believe it or not, but most people who are deploying drones in their, enter in their enterprises, they just don't care about the pictures. All right? They couldn't care less about the picture. So in here, you're about trying to get that picture into an actual piece of information. Or a part of the equation is there a damage. You know, are there people there? Have I, have I detected a person uh, in the field in my search? Is there a crack on that bridge? Is there an actual uh, problem with my solar panel? Et cetera, et cetera. And then the last piece is the execution. Now, the execution comes with a strong integration component because historical companies already have their software stack and their processes to act, to send people to fix something, to send a crew to rescue that person, or to send someone who's going to be doing a deeper dive into it. And of course, there is also more insightful that can be happening here. So let me walk you through like the first step. Navigation, I mentioned, it's about keeping yourself up in the sky and staying steady over there. And we have a lot of companies who have been doing work, like Iris Automation in San Francisco. They use cameras on the side to do detections of the environment. As you're trying to fly in the air in an environment in context like BV loss beyond vision line of sight, it becomes very difficult for you to predict what can happen to you. And a lot of people are bringing that we need a UTM system to actually control all these things. But UTM, and this is a very personal perspective, is not a silver bullet. You cannot track with UTM birds. You cannot track with UTM power lines. You cannot track with UTM someone who's going to try to throw something at your drone. And this is why yeah. unmanned traffic management. Think about a God's eye view on everything that is being done by unmanned vehicles. So this is where AI comes into play. You put it behind cameras who are understanding and detecting all these different things, and they're feeding robotics behavior to try to understand how to articulate around that world. The next piece is about data processing. One of the things that we start to realize is as we're putting 10, 100 megapixel cameras on our drones, you have too much data to bring back. You have too much data to send through LTE. You have too much data that actually you don't care about. And so this is where you can have in real time processing of that data to start understanding there is a damage here or there is a person there. And that what you actually want is trying to understand what's the damage and where is it located on whatever I'm looking at. Where is that person? What's that GPS coordinate? And this is where there's an insane amount of work that is yet to be done 
to characterize all the domain knowledge that exists in all the different verticals. And this work can be put on board the aircraft for real-time processing or directly in the hands of the user for behind the radio processing, which still requires you to bring that data back to the end of the user. But it's also very easy because once you're in the hand of the user, you have a lot of very powerful tools to develop these solutions. And this is actually a very important point I'm gonna come back to after. And the last piece is the execution. And this is an interesting part that everybody understands at this point, but there is very little work that has been done. There was an impact on my airplane. What's the repair procedure? If I'm an airline, I wanna be understanding exactly what is the repair order I need to send to what hangar to actually fix this. If I am a wind turbine utility company, I wanna be able to understand when should I need someone to redo, either do a revisit or actually send the repair crew. And so because of this, I think as you can see with me that there's an AI place everywhere. Whether it is to keep these drones flying and make it easy for people to navigate, whether it is to try to understand the environment that you are at the pre-processing, or if it is to actually give uh, stakeholders a decision power in the whole uh, um, pipeline. And the one I wanna highlight, um, sorry, and what I wanna point out is our role at DJI is to bring the means for this whole ecosystem, this whole solution to be actually working together. We're trying to bring all the different actors so that if you're a domain expert in detecting damages on solar panels, we can bring you inside that full solution hand to hand with other actors because at the end, for customers to be adopting these solutions, they need to have their final answer. And what I wanna point out as well, going back into the simplicity of the technology and how important it is for complex technology to be accessible is a recent partnership that we announced with American Airlines. And the case is very simple. You know, airplanes, they get in some sort of trouble sometimes. I don't wanna like scare everybody else, but um, they can get hit by lightning. They can get hit by birds. They can have some minor weather related damages on the aircraft. And airlines are making a lot of work to inspect these aircraft to make sure that they're safe to fly, okay? The work that's being done here is typically using a lift and you send a crew that are inspecting piece by piece the whole aircraft, taking extra caution not to touch the aircraft. Now this can take between eight to 16 hours for each inspection. Now the work they've done, American Airlines, is experimenting with our drones, seeing how far can I go over there? But they don't really wanna be in a position where they just manually fly. The potential they're trying to see here is how it can be automated in the navigation, but also how it can be automated into the classification of the damage. And the proof of concept they managed to build, the spark that came in here, came out of a hackathon. And this is the power of accessibility of technology. Because using one of our Mavic 2, using the mobile SDK, and using Core ML, they put together a very big proof of concept that was showing stakeholders in the company the potential of this technology. To the point that they are seriously going down that path of trying to automate the navigation and the understanding of the damages. So we're very excited about this because this is 100% in line in what we're trying to do. It's all about giving people the means to complete that full picture. How do we get everyone that is specialized in a different area to collaborate together? How do we nurture that ecosystem so we can create this complete enterprise solution where drones have a real impact? That's what we do at DJI. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Uh, we have time for two questions. Yes. You. Sir. Yeah. Uh, do you already use like AI based um, navigation, um, trajectory planning, and things like that, like reinforcement learning? And if so, how do you handle the safety and like certification problems that arise from it? 
So yes, we do use AI already on the drones, on the navigation piece. Most of our drones are you know, a series of computers working together. And uh, one of them is in charge of navigation where the AI component comes into play. Now, there is not a lot of certifications and regulations around the behavior of the aircraft. These are ongoing technical conversations that we're part of, but there is not an actual grid that we go through. Our way of processing this is our own expectations for the aircraft to be as best as possible. And you can take our aircraft, our level of expectation that we have internally for the stability, for the reliability is absolutely incredible. Um, so we do test absolutely every component of the platform, but not per a specific standard or certification, even though we have AI across the board. One more question. Hi. So yesterday, Dr. Kaifuli mentioned that China is developing a lot of AI advances, and uh, and the drone is obviously a very big industry in China. So do you think that uh, how the tension between the US and China can impact the development of drones? So I'll tell you this. Yes, China has a very strong uh, focus on drone technology as a whole. As a matter of fact, there is a mandate to automate a lot of the automation that you're doing in the utility sector by the end of 2020. I will tell you that the impact of drones is bigger than countries. The impact of drones today is bigger than you know, nationalities and ethnicities about any of the things that we can find to you know, bicker at each other. And the reason is very simple. When we talk to people on in the infrastructure world, they tell us a very grim state of the infrastructure, which is we don't have enough people on the planet to maintain the infrastructure that we've built. So we're facing a situation just for that one vertical where we're either gonna let this infrastructure crumble and, and break killing people in the way, hopefully not, or we're gonna have to get ahead of this and trying to get a better perspective for this. If you take, for instance, um, a water dam, there's a very strong, powerful chute made out of concrete where all the water goes down before it goes into the turbines. Now this place needs to be inspected on a regular basis because if you have a crack in it, the water pressure is just gonna tear your, your, your dam apart, okay? Now today to do this, you have to shut it down, build a scaffolding all entire on the inside of it, and send people you know, with flashlights looking at it and taking pictures. It takes months to do that. And what that means is you end up doing an inspection a year or every two years at best. And you rotate like that and you're trying to get around. So that might be enough, but we're building more and more infrastructure. You take that problem with a drone, with an AI stack that is capable of switching between GPS uh, navigation to perception-based navigation in the like of automodality has done, and that inspection work is shrinking to a week, giving you the time to do more of these inspections. Now, for a country like the U.S. that has a more uh, older infrastructure, it's a bigger problem. But China is building its infrastructure very, very quickly. Although it's more recent, they're still going to have to be tackling this at a very massive scale. So the need for me is going to outweigh all the conversation that is going on the site. Cool. Thank you so much, Arnaud. Let's you. Uh, thank you, Arnaud. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Um, okay. Our next speaker like, is Mark Moore. Uh, he's a head of, uh, yeah, he's a director of vehicle systems or head of Uber Elevate. Um, He's a PhD from Georgia Tech, worked at NASA. But I want to like, share like, an interesting story about Mark. Um, you know, a few months ago, there was a meetup we organized, and Mark was part of it. And one of the, uh, you know, the panelists were saying that you, know, you, you could aptly call Mark as one of the modern age, one of the Wright brothers, right? And after the talk, it was totally evident. I was totally blown away by what he was, uh, you know, what they're doing and what he has accomplished in his life. So please, uh, you know, welcome Mark Moore for an exciting talk about Uber Elevate. Thank you. Okay, great. 
Uh, thanks very much. Uh, thanks for having me here. I'm really excited to talk to such a great group. AI has major, major uh, place to play as we put together what are really big drones, and more than just really big drones that are carrying people around, um, it is very much an entire new ecosystem uh, and transportation system that we're developing at Uber with many, many partners. So I'm excited to jump in and first of all explain why, why is Uber taking to the skies, right? Because you know us as a ride sharing service on the ground, but we are all about productivity in cities. And just like you, uh, here in the Silicon Valley, we're stuck in gridlock on the ground with our cars as well. And really need to think about this with a bigger picture view um, in order to, for ride sharing to really help um, alleviate the congestion and provide a massive improvement in the productivity that we can achieve in, in, in transportation. So just as you see here in major cities, they've essentially grown up from uh, being down on the ground. And that's what we're doing too with this new system. We are taking advantage of that third dimension and growing up uh, into the skies to be able to do ride sharing and again, take advantage of the opportunities to dramatically increase productivity. That is what this is all about. So in the future, in fact, in five years, if you're in a few select cities, you will be able to choose Uber Air from your app. And it will be one more choice over the many different platforms um, that we work with, whether that's scooters, bikes, um, cars, uh, black car service, or even electric vertical takeoff and landing drones or air taxis. So why would we do this? Well, because congestion is really grinding many of these major cities to a halt. And you can see here that as you look at the different choices, if we could take into, go into that third dimension, then we could be doing many, many trips much, much faster. And the trip density of these large urban areas really provides the opportunity for this to be done with very compelling economics that I'm gonna show you later. So what's an example trip like? Well, you may uh, fly into LAX and need to get to the Staples Center and you can choose an UberX uh, on the ground um, during rush hour, but that'll take you about an hour and 20 minutes to go 16 miles. Or you could uh, go over to the Skyport that's gonna be located right by uh, LAX and fly there and including all intermodal delays be there in 27 minutes. So this is about short distance travel in aviation. And when I say short distance, for aviation, 60 miles is a very, very short distance. Now for a car or if you're walking or taking a bike, that's a very long distance. But the average mission that we're seeing, because we have a lot of demand data, we do 10 million trips a day, um, the average distance where this type of transportation service is really going to be optimal is, is about 25 miles. But what we need to do, and, and so these vehicles will be cruising at about 150 miles per hour. The vehicles will be sized to have a pilot in the beginning, uh, along with four passengers, um, as well as to have uh, safety reserves as well. But what's really important to maximize the productivity of this service is that these vehicles can keep doing it repeatedly as all electric uh, to uh, take advantage and get to those really low costs. So you see here essentially what one of these vehicles looks like from the battery perspective, where you do these repeated short trips and in between each uh, average 10 minute flight, you do a rapid recharge while you're loading and unloading the, the passengers. So you have about five minutes on the ground to get as much electricity back into those batteries without damaging them before you do the next trip. And so essentially you cycle down that battery over these peak hours in the morning and in the afternoon to be able to provide that continuous operations and high utilization from these vehicles. 
So you may ask, where are you going to be flying from? And it will be an evolution of infrastructure. In the beginning, we'll take advantage of the upper decks of parking garages to be able to um, fly uh, uh, essentially five uh, aircraft from any uh, specific location at one moment in time. But then, um, as this type of system evolves, uh, we'll be de developing dedicated infrastructure. And one thing that you'll notice about even the, the, the initial infrastructure or the later infrastructure, it will tend to be located close to highways or major arteries and tend to be elevated off of the ground. And that is so that we can keep the noise away from the ground uh, cities. Um, even though these are really quiet aircraft, drastically quieter than helicopters on the order of 15 decibels quieter. But the idea is that we make sure that we don't uh, distract from the current environment of the cities, but instead we can blend into the noise as much as possible. And also, since we're talking about intermodal trips, that we can quickly, you, you can get from um, your Uber Air vehicle and into an Uber X to be able to complete that as a door-to-door -door transportation service. So as the last speaker talked about as well, UTM, NASA's unmanned traffic management system, we are leveraging that. In fact, we hired the lead NASA researcher who developed uh, UTM to come uh, lead our airspace efforts, as well as other NASA employees who are also assisting, to essentially take UTM to the next level, which we call these dynamic skylane networks where we're gonna be able to route traffic without controller interaction and be able to uh, create these corridors where the vehicles can fly and know that they're deconflicted. So there's a lot of really important uh, AI contributions to this type of network, as well as batching the vehicles and uh, aligning them with uh, the users and when they wanna travel, where they wanna travel. It's a very complex uh, network management problem as well as an airspace uh, opportunity. So as I mentioned before, with cost. So in the beginning, you know, if we tried to do this with helicopters, it would be very expensive, right? And we've done it. We've done Uber chopper um, experiments in many different locations and many special events. Uh, helicopters are very complex and very expensive. They use a lot of energy because they're very inefficient both from the propulsive efficiency and aerodynamic efficiency perspectives. So if you try to do this with helicopters, you're gonna pay about $9 per passenger mile. So that is way too expensive to be relevant to all of us in this room. Well, we're taking advantage of these new type of aircraft, which uh, when I was at NASA for 32 years, in fact, that's the only thing I did in my career, was specialize in these new type of vertical takeoff and landing aircraft that utilize distributed electric propulsion. Uh, and I was fortunate that I led three of the demonstrators that NASA did over the last 10 years that really pioneered this technology and made it ready for commercialization. So right off the bat with these new aircraft in limited production, we can get rid of about 30% uh, of the cost from helicopters. And most of that is, is due to the energy costs and the efficiency of these new electric uh, aircraft. But as we were able to, to go from the initial network operations in 2024 with 50 aircraft per cities uh, and take that to about 300 aircraft uh, with higher uh, production volume across the manufacturers and higher utilization as we've worked out the network issues, we can get that cost down to a critical point where it's actually competitive with what UberX costs you today and that is about $2 per passenger mile. So very quickly, by 2025 in our estimates, we'll be able to be competitive uh, on the ground. And there is a caveat to that, right? With an UberX, typically you're taking that UberX by yourself unless you're taking advantage of our pooling option and express pool options. And the difference is, is that in the air, the pooling is built in so that we can maximize the load factor, the occupants of those vehicles, to get to these low uh, prices. So when I say comparable, in the air, you're pooling on the ground. Maybe you're not, but you should be if you really want to help with congestion. And in the future, beyond that, when we start having 1,000 aircraft per cities, 
and we have multiple manufacturers manufacturing on the order of two to 5,000 units per day, which is very different from what helicopters do. They're made at about 100 units per day, and that's why they cost two and a half million dollars. So as we drive you know, to that future state of efficient networks and mass production vehicles, we're actually talking about being able to be competitive with your marginal costs of operating the car. And the reason why is because each one of these, these Uber Air aircraft is as effective, is as productive as 20 of our Uber X on the ground. And we're using them uh, to such an extent of about 2,000 hours per year that we can amortize, amortize the cost of that vehicle very effectively, much better than you can with your car that's sitting in your driveway or garage for 95% of the time. So it really is a very exciting future as these different new things come together of not just new technologies, but new business models such as the shared economy, and very much to optimize these solutions. It depends on AI. So there's just so much for us to do together. Now, I'm actually the director of the vehicle systems. I live and breathe uh, these vehicles and have my entire life. They are very, very different from helicopters, and that's why you'll see they have fixed wings, because if you want to cruise efficiently and at high speed, you're not going to be doing a multi-copter because they're very slow and very inefficient. You're going to be having a wing like these representative uh, co uh, concepts. So um, very, very different than what a helicopter looks like and how a helicopter behaves. You have redundancy built in so that even if one of the motors fails or one of the propellers fails, you can still fly, take off, and land safely. So redundant propulsion and control is very much at the heart of the, the design of these new aircraft. We have five different uh, major manufacturers developing experimental aircraft for us now that will start flying in 2020 to be ready by 2023. Major companies such as Boeing, Aurora, Embraer, Bell, and some smaller companies like Pipistrel and Karam that you may not have heard of. Each one has a unique solution a unique aircraft that looks completely different than the others. That's what kind of exciting Wright Brother era we're in, where nobody knows exactly what that aircraft should look like, um, and there's so much open design space to, uh, to work with it. Um, th this Karam aircraft, actually, we've shown that could work with near-term batteries. Again, we're matching these vehicles with what batteries can do in the near term, not some magic batteries five or 10 years from now. So again, we can only go short distances though, but that's really ma uh, matches up well with um, uh, uh, where the trip density is. We've already announced um, uh, Dallas and Los Angeles are, as our first two cities, and soon we'll be announcing a third international city. To top it all off, not only are we doing these big drones to carry people, we've announced that we're also uh, expanding to our next level with Uber Eats, and that we'll be doing small drones um, to be able to carry food and essentially maximize the reach of our participating uh, network partners so that they can provide the best, most rapid service possible. And we've already uh, jumped into a partnership with the FAA and municipalities to be able to start uh, performing those demonstration flights. So it is a, a very exciting era of aviation, um, and it's wonderful that uh, essentially what we're doing is we're matching the ingenuity and innovation and agility of the Silicon Valley with the uh, discipline and safety and expertise of the aerospace world and coupling it all into one new ecosystem that is going to make this happen very, very quickly. Thank you so very much for your time. I, Hope you're excited about this future as well as I am. Okay. Um, we have time for two questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, you elegantly explained the cost effectiveness of uh, the system. I was wondering if you could uh, explicitly compare the carbon footprint of a fully occupied 
air vehicle with like a car fully occupied? That's a great question. What is the environmental responsibility of this new system? And honestly, it all depends on the electric grid uh, that you're pulling from. Uh, in California, we're fortunate that the electricity is about half the emissions of that in most of the other states in the United States. So making sure that we're drawing uh, electricity from a clean grid is the answer to that really low carbon uh, solution. Um, and from my perspective, that's not just going to happen. We need a forcing function to drive to the next stage of utilities, right? Right now, the utilities are kind of uh, at the stage, well, okay, prove that there's the, the need for this electricity, and then we'll go there um, with these clean energy solutions. So we consider this transportation system of Uber Elevate a forcing function to help drive the utilities to these future clean grids. And if they are leveraging solar um, and wind and all the different opportunities that we have for renewables, this will be an ultra clean, low emission solution for the future. If we stay with the status quo and there aren't forcing functions that drive to it, then we're not in a good place for emissions independent of whatever transportation solution, solution uh, is proposed. And I would say the key differentiator, this is a great question, the key differentiator between this and Hyperloop or light rail or centralized transportation solutions, this is a distributed transportation solution, which is node-based. So it, it tends to be very efficient at certain types of trips that want to be node-based. And for instance, as we have a 50 Skyport network in Los Angeles, if we add one more node, we've just created 50 new route and opportunities. While if Hyperloop adds one more node, you just get one more stop. So there is incredible power in node-based transportation networks and efficiency, and that's why we're driving to it. Great question, thank you. Yeah, hi. Uh, one of the main concern as a consumer will have the safety while taking off and, t and landing is the main play when it can things go wrong. And recently, an English Premier League uh, owner of Leicester City, he took off from the ground after the match and everybody died. So if uh, that can happen with individual helicopters, but this is not a helicopter, still, I think uh, one of the main thing would be, and will there be any air traffic control involved? Yeah, that's all. Yeah. So I think the question is all about safety, you know, and um, how the vehicles um, uh, can be uh, in a, uh, a state of uh, concern during the takeoff and landing, especially um, when they don't have forward velocities to be able to glide to a solution and how airspace safety is gonna be achieved. Is that kind of the question? Okay, so again, these are nothing like helicopters. Helicopters have one big rotor and hundreds of parts that if any one of them fail, the whole helicopter is coming down. We don't have that. The, this type of aircraft is so different because it's designed as a redundant system. There is no single fault criticality for these new type of aircraft. They are redundant. So that if any single part fails, we can continue to fly. That is the epiphany, the big change about the inherent safety of these vehicles. Um, in terms of the airspace safety, how do you achieve that? One of the biggest answers is um, in terms of pilots. 70% of all aviation accidents are essentially due to pilots. We need to push aggressively to autonomy. But the FAA needs statistical proof that the software and the avionics system is capable and better than a pilot. So that's why from 2024 to 2028, we have that period of time to build in um, this autonomy into the vehicles and then prove statistically to the FAA with tens to hundreds of millions of flights that this software is better than any pilot. So driving to autonomy as quickly as we can is one of the most important things for safety, but also 
Operational safety is all about good fleet management. You know, if you have an individual helicopter that flies around, he's landing who knows where, and how good is the maintenance? What we're doing is fleet maintenance, similar to what happens with airlines today on specific routes. We never go deviate from those routes. We only land at skyports where we have known operational safety. Thank you for that question. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mark, for a Thank great you. talk. Thank you.